Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! No! Oh! oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic championship. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Hello. I feel like a real athlete. How so? Because I have to have physical therapy. <laughs> it's so your foot. Hurt. Yeah, the, the, the foot is healing, but, you know, range of motion is not what it's supposed to be. Doctor said today, we have to get you into physical therapy. And all I imagined was big, burly men yanking my foot in the wrong direction. No, it will be much better than that. But what I also thought of is, I'm going to have my own training montage set to music. <laughs> so maybe that'll show up on our YouTube channel. <laughs> I, for one, will subscribe to that. So. I have the tiger and Allison. <laughs> All right. Today we are excited for our last book club session of the year. So Book Club Claire is back with us to talk Snowball's Chance, the story of the 1960 Olympic Winter Games, Squaw Valley and Lake Tahoe by David C. Antonucci. Take a listen. Claire, welcome back. We are talking Snowball's Chance, the story of the 1960 Olympic Winter Games, Squaw Valley and Lake Tahoe by David C. Antonucci. Before we really get into the book, let's talk a little bit about the name of the place, which is now a little problematic these days. Allison, what have you found out? Yes. So recently we reported on the name being changed to Palisades Tahoe and that the former name is both considered sexist and racist. So definitely problematic, but did some research, did some talking to people, spoke to Tom Kelly spoke to some other people in the ski community, some other people in IOC circles. IOC has not come down with a definitive statement on if they will continue to refer to the 1960 Winter Games as Squaw Valley, use a new name, use something different. Some documents have the old name. Some documents just say California 1960 host city. So the consensus and is kind of a, a working consensus is for now, when you are referring to the historical event, it is okay to use the old city name. You just don't want to overdo it. Which is interesting because even in the book by Antonucci, in page five, it mentions that the Board of Geographical Nations changed the name to Olympic Valley in the late 1950s. So it's just that that name hasn't been widely circulated, even though it, that's been 70 years ago that that was instituted. I would like to call it Olympic Valley, but it sounds like even now the, that's not official. So from now on, we'll kind of leave it to Lake Tahoe or Palisades, Lake Tahoe or whatever works best. But honestly, I'm totally OK with the name change. It was very interesting to read this book and see it written down so much, but I appreciate your explanation about it. And we've recognized the problematicness of it. And now we're going to go on with that. Well, thoughts on the book, first of all. I miss Winter Olympics that feel like, let's go in the barn and put on an Olympics. <laughs> you know, when we read about a lot of these old timey Olympics, especially the Winter Games, because they were so much smaller, it really was just, let's get Cousin Ruth and Uncle Joe to put this together with a, with a shoestring. Yeah. And for me... This was another case of nothing was in the area, really. There was some skiing, but really so much development happened to make 1960 the games happen. And it's brought up the region as a ski center. But it just really is, again, let's put on a games. And I thought that was fabulous. I knew nothing about these Olympics. I'll be completely honest. When I think of the U.S. hosting a Winter Olympics, I automatically go to Lake Placid and Salt Lake City. I don't think of any other time. So finally being able to see what the 1960 games in Lake Tahoe was all about and how it all came together kind of in a shoestring way. Like, for example, they did not have bobsled because they just 
couldn't put it together. So this was like one of the only Olympics. We, we were just talking about a future book that we're going to be doing on bobsled in 1932. And you go all the way to 1960, no bobsled. That must have been crushing for those athletes. And what's so strange to me is that that was okay. I mean, if you think about the controversies that we've had regarding bobsled over the past couple bids, where the Stockholm bid was having it in Latvia, and now the Milan Cortina organizers are really struggling to figure out where bobsled is going to be. There's no just eliminating an entire category of events by a host city and that it was, oh, sorry, we can't build a sliding center. It's okay. Just it reminds you how much different it is now and how much smaller and less bureaucratic it was at the time. Right. And how probably fewer people were involved with the sport. And how much it was really relying on amateurs, I would say for the most part still, because now you have athletes who this is their livelihood and it has to be a full-time job in order to be competitive. So if you took that all away now, you've just erased that for so many people. And that there was no luge or skeleton happening. Right. That it was just, there was no women's bobsled. There was just, you know, four man, two man. That was it. It wasn't. 10 other events that now got eliminated because you didn't build a sliding track. And it's it's interesting to hear how how little there was because go through each chapter and it does cover like each discipline and then all of a sudden you're done. You go, "Wait, there's like 10 more events that we should be covering." But in 1960 that wasn't the case, you know, no women's biathlon, of course, no women's um Nordic combines, no curling. So a lot of the winter sports that we know as mainstays didn't even exist or weren't even a thought in anybody's mind at that point. Yet at the same time, while we have this kind of rough Winter Olympics, it's still also very progressive when it comes to Winter Olympics. They had a giant data processing center, many hours of coverage. I think over 30 hours of coverage were broadcast live via CBS. Did you read they had the first? what was it, instant replay because of a finish? And they're like, oh, this guy actually filmed it and the, the Soviets are complaining about it. So let's just look at the footage. That was the first time it had ever been done. This Olympics brought in so many things and yet we barely remember it. And I just find it amazing that they kept mentioning new things and I'm going, oh, that was when it started? It was, it was incredible to, to hear about these kinds of things with this book. It felt very much like the Winter Paralympics is now. They had, I think, in 1960, if I remember correctly, it was 30-something countries competing and the number of athletes and the number of sports. It felt like that small, limited community that we experienced with the Winter Paralympics. What interested me was also hearing about the differences in the events, where, speaking of biathlon, they had four different target areas and four different distances to shoot from. Which was just kind of, it was really interesting how it was laid out. And today it's just, there is one shooting range and it is one distance that you shoot from versus a whole different type of sport where it really was go out in the woods and you might have to shoot something from this distance and you go a little farther. Oh, the enemy is much farther away. It was just really kind of cool to see that sort of event. And then there was also speed skating, which was taking place outdoors. And you have to deal with the elements in that case. But this also was the first time that artificial ice was used. It wasn't natural. And they used Zambonis for the first time. So they're having these old ideas of things where, you know, having ice outside is the only way to do it. But at the same time, they're starting to implement these modern conveniences to help make these sports even better. I thought what was crazy is Blythe Arena, which was the one that that actually burned down recently, which is very unfortunate, was an indoor outdoor stadium. So you're also dealing with like the cold coming in one side and the poor figure skaters are trying to do their routines with this. I can't imagine how that would have been pulled off. And even like the afternoon sun or the morning sun coming in, hearing the ways that these events were put on after so many winter Olympics of having it very consistent. It really blew my mind how, how it all worked. It's admirable, I do have to say. And with figure skating, when you think about when we watch old figure skating recordings, how simplistic the figure skating looks. You have single jumps. You have a lot of spins that are very slow. But when you think about a lot of this was done outside, 
with, like you were saying, natural ice and inconsistent temperatures, it's a miracle that we didn't have blown out knees left and right. Of course, they couldn't do a triple jump because you didn't know if you were going to be jumping off a puddle. So how the sports have changed so much because we control the conditions, both speed skating, figure skating, even the ski runs, so much of it is artificial snow that's very controlled. And here, when we, you were saying oh, it's this kind of rough and tumble scenario out west, it changes the sports so dramatically. And lots of woolen caps. I love the pictures with all the woolly caps. And you would never see a woolly cap out on a ski run now during a competition. I do wish, I mean, all the pictures came from the same guy, Bill Briner. And I do wish there had been a few more up close shots. I, these must have been, you know, amateur. These are the kind of pictures that I would have taken back then. Because, you know, you're far away, you're just taking a, a general shot of things, but there's no up close photos, which I thought was unfortunate. But it was nice that we actually had pictures to look at straight from the day, from the events. Oh, oh, there was an up close photo of the German figure skater, the very lovely blonde pear skater. We got a really close up shot of her. I wonder why. I do have to mention with the, um, you're mentioning a, a German figure skater. I, I was reading up on skiing and the ski items go back to back. And so I'm reading and it, every chapter gives an epilogue and kind of, okay, these are the people that we just talked about in the chapter. Here's what happened after the Olympics were done. So I'm reading about women's skiing and I'm reading about the bronze medalist, Barbara Henneberger, Henneberger, my mistake. And it mentions, oh, she died in a ski accident as she was filming a movie. And I go, oh, man, that's so sad. I'm so, that's just such a bummer. Then I go to the next chapter and it's about Buddy Werder. And it also says he died in a ski accident. And I went, wait a minute. And, and that's all it says in the book. It doesn't mention anything else. So I had to do, I had to do some digging. And I had to look. Willie Bogner was also a part of this. And he wanted to film a ski movie. And he was trying to do like a choreographed ski routine, like almost like a musical, but on skis. And apparently as they were working on this, Bogner ignored some avalanche warnings. And that's when a giant avalanche took place. And both Barbara Henneberger and Buddy Werner died in that. And that was one thing where I kind of wish they had given more in the book, but it did provide the opportunity to look at it a little more closely and also realize that I believe Bunny Werner is the same guy that was featured in The Other Side of the Mountain, the movie that you guys watched, where he was in love with her and then he went away and then he died. I was like, oh, I'm learning so much now about a scheme that I never knew before. I found that to be fascinating. Right. In the movie, Buddy is the first boyfriend who breaks up with her after she's paralyzed. So that I did note that as well. I said, oh, Buddy's back. And now he's dead. Not to make light of it, but just sort of in that story, we talked about that he did die in a skiing accident, but not realizing that there was connection to an additional movie. Speaking of skiers, the one who really caught my eye, and I did not realize he was connected to 60, was Jean Voirnet. Did you, Allison, have the Voirnet brand in high, I remember this from high school that guys would have Voirnay sunglasses brand T-shirts. And I never knew what that was until I read this book and went, oh, my goodness. And I did a little looking up. And sure enough, like, oh, that put two and two together in my head. That's quite interesting. I, I don't know this brand. This is, I'm showing my age here. But <laughs> well, we're showing our age. That's for sure. But but it was. It was something like he was skiing and something it was a sporty brand in the, the late eighties that was it was popular. So it was interesting that I had no idea it was tied to a nineteen sixty Olympian. The other one the I liked the epilogues a lot. That helped a lot with putting a lot of two and two together. But what he didn't get into was Carol Heiss, going back to figure skating. Carol Heiss won the gold medal. And she is the sister-in-law of the men's gold medal winner, David Jenkins. And she now lives in the, the Cleveland area. She was a coach here for a very long time. But that did not show up in the epilogue. And I was very, very surprised. In my brain, she's always Carol Heiss Jenkins because that's how she was always interviewed later. <laughs> and for a long time, 
because it was Hayes Jenkins is her husband and he was a figure skater as well. And I would always get so confused as to who was married to who. And then Dick Button was in that same time and I got all confused. So. I, I noticed a couple of names, but not enough to be like, oh my gosh, I remember this. But it's more like, oh, I think I've heard that person before. But it is interesting. I wonder if we went up to like 1972 or something like that, where it would pull out the, or 76 maybe in Innsbruck, where it would pull out these, I've heard of these people, or I saw something randomly related, and that would click in your brain the way this one is clicking for us. And, and I was very shocked that it did that for me, how the, the future lives of Olympians really connect with people for decades. Yeah, even with these athletes, you know, eventually becoming coaches and personalities in the business themselves, that's how I would know them. I wouldn't know them from being just regular athletes like this. I really did enjoy just finding out all about these Olympics and putting everything together, including one Walt Disney. And there were some names mentioned in the opening ceremony bit, and even that the torch was designed by John Hench. And to me, I know who John Hench is. He was one of the Imagineers for Disneyland under Walt Disney. And just hearing about how all that got put together, that's where I wish there was some, I don't know if there's a video somewhere, but I would love to see how a Disney production in, the, in 1960 would be different from a Disney production today. But just, just to have the Walt Disney putting your stuff together, what a coup. And I think that's marvelous and how, how they were able to get that done. You know, other than the mention of the length of time and the fireworks, there wasn't a lot of nitty gritty detail of the ceremonies. And I would have liked, I agree with you, I would have liked almost like a second by second rundown from the Disney archives as to what was performed, who was performing it, what were the costumes, exactly how those ceremonies would have played out and look like it in 1960. I mean, we know they were very small. We know it was very simple. But what did that actually mean? Because you had Walt Disney, who knew how to put on a show. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I actually went to the official report. And what's in this book is pretty much what's in the official report. So it was kind of like, we all knew Walt Disney brought some kind of pageantry to the games that probably affected them going forward in terms of how organizing committees viewed the opening ceremonies and even the closing ceremonies. But we never really got a sense of what that pageantry actually was. It just felt like, oh, there's there's special music, there's a parade of nations, there's our oaths, and we've got fireworks. And Disney came up with these really cool looking statues that created a big atmosphere, and unfortunately, they have not survived. Such a bummer, because that would have been really cool to see. And the opening ceremony lasted one hour. Can you imagine it lasting one hour nowadays? Well, there were 32 teams and like four athletes competing. So it And was zero commercials. Oh, look, NBC's taking another commercial break. I mean, I, that doesn't really affect the live airing of the ceremony. The ceremony would have been four hours regardless. But at the same time, let's just say there's too many commercials in the Olympics. Anyway, it is also cool that they brought in. I mean, I I guess I didn't realize really that there is there is a connection between Hollywood and Northern California. So they did bring up like they brought up Danny Kaye. They brought up Art Linkletter, who was a, a TV personality. And one of the coaches complained that how are these athletes going to get a good night of sleep when you've got Frank's not just playing out across the street. I love that. And I think that those kinds of stories we would never have heard if not for a book like this, which is unfortunate because that kind of stuff in, in the 1950s, 1960s time period would have been really cool to see it. And stuff that's if nowadays especially is getting missed because those people are now passing away. And so a lot of those stories are lost, which makes me very thankful for a book like this. Were there any sports that stuck out besides the ones that we had already talked about? Can we talk about men's hockey? Please do. Speaking of, yes. Yeah, so this was the first miracle on ice where the U.S. men won unexpectedly. And I remember the stories being they won in 1960 and then in obviously the miracle on ice in 1980. And I remember at in the 2000s them talking about, oh, the U.S. men are due and how much pressure the U.S. men were under as that sort of 20-year mark came around, came and went. 
but fun to see that it was another team of kind of scrappy young kids put together beating these much more experienced teams. And also how tiny the tournament was. Oh, yeah. There were, what, eight teams? I, I don't know, but it's like, boom, now you're in the middle round. Congratulations, everybody. And who, who got left off the roster? Oh, wasn't that the coach of the Miracle on Ice team? Yep, Herb Brooks. Yeah, he was one of the last men cut. And how we joke a lot about when we do movie club of the player who missed out and then comes back as the coach. And there it was. He had been cut from the 1960 team and then coached the 1980. So he was a human trope for a movie. It was just made to happen. I also really enjoyed, there were a couple of, of instances where they, they mentioned like the mighty country that always dominates. I think that was like cross-country skiing and how the Soviets were really coming into the fore. This was kind of like the precursor to them completely dominating everything. And hearing how countries like Austria or Sweden were struggling in, some, in certain sports, like their darlings were ending up not living up to expectations. I loved hearing about that because we hear about that nowadays with the mighty countries that you expect every single person from that country to meddle in something. And it ended up that, you know, they, they blew it. Norway is one, especially in like ski jumping, where you expect them to take it and maybe they have more struggles than you realize, or maybe they dominate. I actually thought that the ski jumping portion was quite interesting, maybe more interesting than actually watching it. Maybe that's how I like to watch my ski jumping. I did enjoy the picture of the Superman pose because apparently that's how they jumped back then. Arms outstretched in front of them. Okay, then. I agree. I, I enjoyed that picture a lot because what a difference in form today. Another one is the speed skating how the artificial ice, which I mentioned earlier, made such a difference. The men's 10,000 race ends up having five skaters beat the world record that day. Can you imagine being breaking the world record and not even getting a medal? Wait, that happened in Tokyo with the 400 meter hurdles for the men. That's Remember, right. like everybody got a massive record? No, I think that the bronze medalist broke the world record, but he got a bronze. I don't think anybody else did. Where they were uh, down the line, they broke national records yes. and country records and yeah. regional yes, records. Yes. So yes. it was, oh, we broke the Asian record. Oh, we broke the country record. But yeah, for, it was the same thing where it was just so wild. But you have this major jump technology. It reminded me in Sydney with the skin suits. Mm. Oh, yeah. And then they all were breaking records left and right and then took away the suits. It was almost the same thing where all of a sudden you have this brand new technology that completely changes the game. And they almost had to skate differently on the artificial ice than they did on natural ice. And everyone was shocked, like, oh, there's once again, there's not a giant puddle we have to account for. We can just focus on form and skating. Gosh, I can't even imagine that. But that's how it was. It blows my mind that things weren't as consistent everywhere that you went. I mean, how nowadays would in a half open arena fly but you know with, with the largeness of like hockey teams it's like okay this hockey team is going to play in the indoor outdoor arena and this one's going to be outdoors and this one's going to be indoors you'd have people would be having fits left and right well the nhl does that annual outdoor hockey right. game now isn't that a christmas time well it's kind of a series now they have like four different games in the winter time and the players are like we don't know what we're doing this is great this is like being a kid mm -hmm. on the in the pond at the park and just how different the atmosphere and the, the physics of the sport change being outdoors. However, for, for those NHL games, it's one game in a season, a 70 game season or whatever it is. And this is the Olympics. So nowadays, it, that wouldn't fly at all because, yes, you're kind of leveling the playing field. Everybody's struggling the same way, but you need to give them pristine conditions or else they're going to just riot and refuse to compete. Any other things about the book that you wanted to cover? Okay, so we've been nice. I will say, I have some thoughts. This was an interesting read. I will say that. I learned a lot about a games I did not know. There are a lot of details that I found were fascinating. I liked, for the most part, the epilogues of people that were referenced or even not referenced in the main part of the chapter. But this one is self-published. And it's written by somebody who 
had a career as an engineer. And I think that way of thinking came through in the writing because it was a bit dry. And it, it took, I had to put it down and pick it up a lot. And it did take me a while to get through it. I also gained a huge appreciation for footnotes and endnotes because while this book has an index, and we all know that I love an index, it does not have any footnotes. And I've, re I've really gained a, a good appreciation for historians who go in and find the story and revolve, even if it's about a game, and then they go, well, I'm sorry, I have a bigger appreciation for David Marinus, thinking of Rome 1960, where he found the story in every sport and told the story. And here we have more of a reporting of what happened with a little bit of story in there, but there were, it, it was that approach made it for me as a reader harder to glom onto and really get drawn in by the games. I'll, I'll go the opposite direction with this because I actually enjoyed this book. Probably it sounds like more than you guys, or at least more than Jill. More than but Jill. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, Rome 1960 was a tome. It was gigantic. And it did take me a long time to read because I tend to read at night before I go to bed, take out, read a chapter. Those chapters were long. I'm sitting there going, I need to actually like go to sleep. And I'm still like 10 pages away from the end. This was, I open it up. I read a chapter. Awesome. I just learned more about biathlon. Shut it. Go to bed. And I liked that. I liked how it was simple reporting. And as I mentioned before, not a lot of the the stories that that they wrote in here were ones that I knew. So yes, if I wanted a little more to it, I could look into it like I did with the, with the skiers that died in the, in the skiing accident. It allowed me to open up and, and do some research myself. But for something that was giving me an overview of the entire Winter Olympics, I liked it for that. And I I did it's going to sound weird. I did kind of like that dryness where it's just, okay, this is what happened. Here's how it went. Let's move on. I thought that was nice. It was a good change of pace to what we, what we have been reading. So I'm not going to argue that I'm not going to say it was a magnificent book. Everyone should read it, but it's a great book to get the information. Fair point. Allison, what do you think? I can go both ways on this. You know, that now that I've listened to both of you, because there's a part of me that did miss that deep archival, reading every letter, finding every diary, doing interviews, the way David Marinus, the way Andrew Marinus, the way some of the other historical writers that we go into and having a character and a through line for the entire thing. But on the other hand, it was snippets and it was vignettes of each sport that set you in what that sport looked like at the time. But Am I going to remember any of the people because I read this book? No. That's true. That's true. I, I was like, I'm trying to figure out, oh, where was it? Where did I get that story from? And I'm trying to leaf through it. I'm going, I can't find it. I don't even remember. So, yes, that there is that. I definitely wanted more. I definitely wanted more stories of people who went, people who were there. He gave a few little snippets talking about a little bit about the traffic and a little bit about the parking and a little bit about some of those concerns. But I wanted to hear more of somebody who went and got stuck on the highway and had to just haul up to the mountain on foot and carrying their lunch in their bag because there was no food service or whatever those those pieces were. I didn't get enough of what would what it was like to attend these Olympics. I agree. That would have been nice. Yes. Good. Good point. So it could be a book for everybody. Well, it's small enough that you can get to everybody's level. And if you wanted to build on it. You could build on it. If you thought that this was enough for you to know, then you could stop. I, I did want to mention one thing before we, before we move on that, okay, when Lake Tahoe was giving their bid for the Olympics, who objected? Our good pal, Avery Brundage. He comes up a couple times in this. He's like, oh, you know, when it sounded like the, the bid was going to fall through, he's like, oh, good. People, they've finally come to their senses. And he was so against the bid almost the entire time until it actually got the vote and came and became a thing. And then he's like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to get behind this. Like, no, nope. I didn't bring him up. <laughs> Don't point that out. I will gladly bring him up just to get Allison's reaction. That's why I brought him up. You know what? 
I did not even absorb much about him in this book because he was so minor. He shows up on a couple of pages and there's no talk about what a horrible person he is and him doing something really awful like he has done in so many other stories that we've told that I just kind of missed him here. I was like, oh yeah, Avery showing up being dumb. That's fine. Wanting his way, smoking a cigarette. Great. It does bring to mind that if we ever have like a bet on something, like the losing bet needs to be that one of our book club books needs to be like a biography of Avery Brundage. So we're forced to to read into him. I would, I would probably gouge my eyes out, but I don't even know if there is. There probably is. But okay. So but just to finish that thought, and this is a good, probably a good place to finish up. Whenever we talk to our writers that we talk to frequently, who've done a lot of historical books, we will say, have you ever thought about writing about Avery Brundage? Oh, really? Because they're, yeah, I always ask. I always ask because it's I'm me. Because there really isn't a good, in-depth, up-to-date, critical biography of him. And the general consensus is nobody wants to live with him long enough to write the book. That's the bottom line. Final thoughts on this book. I'm glad you chose it. I will say, even though I, I had trouble with the style, I learned a lot about these games. And I always appreciate filling in some of the black holes of my Olympic knowledge. So I appreciated this book for that reason. I also appreciated getting some fun facts about not just 1960, but some of the athletes and learning a little bit more. This book actually got me very excited about the potential for the growth of the Paralympics because I said it reminded me so much of where the, the Winter Paralympics is now. And we've certainly seen how far the Winter Olympics has come since 1960 and how much has developed and how sport has grown and how so many more countries participate and around the world. It's not just Europe and North America. And it got me thinking, okay, this is a template that the Winter Paralympics can look at and say, we can keep growing and not just be this little scrappy, tiny games, but this huge worldwide and not just 32 countries in this little town in, in North California. And I appreciated the book because it was only 171 pages. That too. It had lots of pictures. I don't, people can, I mean, when they see the image online, all they see is the cover and they might not actually comprehend that it is only 171 pages. So if you're looking for something short and you want to read more about some Winter Olympics, this is your book. So enjoy it while you've got it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claire. That brings us to a close for our book list for 2022. What's coming up for 2023? Oh, we've got some great books. We're covering a wide variety of things, which I always love. And we're going to be covering a very interesting topic at the end of the year. But at the beginning of the year, you actually arranged with author Andrew Marinus to talk to him a little more about his new book called Inaugural Ballers, which is about the first women's basketball tournament in the Olympics in Montreal in 1976. So that's going to be our first book in March of this coming year. Then we are going to be taking a look at Oksana Masters' memoir. If you know Oksana Masters, she is a summer and winter Paralympian, and she wrote a book called The Hard Parts, A Story of Courage and Triumph. That's actually coming out in February, so there's no advanced copies out yet. But once we finish the Marinus book, we are going to be taking a look at that, so that will be widely available by that time. I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing about her story because you may have seen or heard her story on NBC. They talk about it ad nauseum, but I, I'm going to enjoy hearing it straight from her. Then later in the year, uh, around the end of summer, we are going to be talking about The Dirtiest Race in History by Richard Moore, which talks about the doping controversy that took place in the athletics world for the 1988 Olympics in Seoul. If you are familiar with that, we're going to dig into that. Our first real book about doping to the extreme. So I'm very much curious about it because I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about Seoul 1988. And so this is going to help me learn a little more about it. And fine. You will. <laughs> hey, hey, anything, just like the book that we just did for 1960, anything that gets me more knowledge of the Olympics, I'll gladly accept. 
And then finally, to wrap up the year in December, we are going to be covering Speed Kings by Andy Bull, which is a book about the 1932 bobsled competition that took place. So I don't believe we've done a bobsled book yet. So that's even more exciting that we're going to be covering a new sport for our book club. Excellent. I'm really excited about this next slate. I'm so excited to have not just another Paralympian book, not just another book related to the Paralympics, but also getting into Oksana Masters, especially after getting to watch her compete and seeing how hard it was in China and how much, oh my gosh, just how much of her body strength she has and all those athletes have in Nordic skiing there. She's amazing and I can't wait to read her story. And very excited to have a book that connects with our historical Olympics of the year as well. So it's going to be a fun year, Claire. Thanks, as always, for heading this up. And we will talk to you in the new year. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, everyone. You can follow Claire on Twitter at at Cauldron Light. We will have next year's selections on our bookshop.org storefront in our book club list there. You know, even if we do, you don't buy a book we recommend, Purchasing through our storefront helps us earn money that goes towards our coverage of Paris 2024. So if you are buying books, please look through our storefront first. That is bookshop.org slash shop slash flame alive pod. That sound means that it is time for our history moment. And all year long, we've been talking about Albertville 1992, as it is the 30th anniversary of those winter games. Allison, it is your turn for a story. So what do you got for us? I have a short little note today, but I think you're going to get excited about it. So the Teatro de Ceremonies, and I know I'm totally butchering that name, was the stadium that they used for the opening and closing ceremonies. It was temporary. Obviously, being that up in the Alberville does not have a giant stadium for anything. Or, or probably need for one. <laughs> exactly. So at the time, it was the largest temporary structure ever to have been built. Whoa. Seated 35,000 people. And it, the shape was modeled after a circus tent, which actually fills a lot of the elements that they included in the opening ceremonies. There was a lot of Cirque du Soleil happening. So they really use that even within the shape of the stadium. It was disassembled right after the closing ceremonies. And the site is now an urban park with hmm. only the flagpole that was used at the time <laughs> remaining. But that was not the last we saw of this temporary stadium. As I said, it was disassembled very, very quickly and sent to Barcelona. Did they use it for Barcelona 92? They did. It was used as temporary for, por portions of it were used as the temporary venues that were used for, in the archery field and on the marathon and race walking course. Huh. That is interesting. So when we talk about legacy, temporary stadium used twice. Nice. Welcome to Shukflistan. That sound means it's time to check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show who are our citizens of our very own country, Shukflistan. We've got some results. At the championship of the Americas, Tim Sherry won a silver medal in the 50 meter men's prone shooting event and another silver as part of the mixed team 50 meter. Excellent. Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes won the AVP event for beach volleyball in their hometown of Huntington Beach, California. Millie Tapper finished fifth in class 10 at the World Para Table Tennis Championships. Sarah Gascon and Team USA Handball lost their Pan Am qualifier against Canada, so unfortunately they will not be going to the Pan Am Games next year. Erin Jackson placed eighth in the 500 meter in her first speed skating World Cup event of the season. She felt it wasn't too bad, given that she still has some inline technique, which she was competing in last week. Seriously, how does this girl do it? Yeah, and, and inline is very different from speed skating on ice. And if you remember our crossover episode with Hear Her Sports, she talked a little bit about that. So go back and look at episode 238 for that. 
And figure skaters Nate Bartholome and Katie McBeath finished sixth in the MK John Wilson Trophy ISU Grand Prix in Sheffield, Great Britain. And in other news, the Indian Olympic Association formed its first Athletes Commission. Guess who's on it? Shiva Keshavan. Yeah! He's our um, favorite Indian athlete. That's right. This is important that India put together an Athletes Commission because they haven't had one. And it's kind of one of the conditions that the IOC wants to to have in place before India gets back into their good graces. So go Shiva. And then Terrence Burns, who we just had on the show recently, has been appointed to the board of a Rumble Town, a Queensland-based strategic creative agency, and he will help them with the build-up to Brisbane 2032. I love how Terrence, when we spoke to him, was like, I don't know if I'm going to get involved. And <laughs> Terrence, you can't stay away. <laughs> right? <laughs> We still need a sounder for our novellas because we have novella news. We just don't have it. Well, wait, hold on. You know what? We'll try this. Okay. In lieu of a, a novella sounder, which we'll work on getting, we'll use that to signal that it's time to talk about the modern pentathlon novella ongoing saga in that sport as it hopes to stay on the program or hopes to even get on the program for LA 2028. So the UIPM, which is its international federation, had its Congress meeting and one of the measures they were voting on was whether or not to replace equestrian with obstacle course raising. Now, the group was advised by Michael Payne, who is a former IOC marketing director, and he had a bunch of tough love to dish out. And our friend Rich Perlman over at the Sports Examiner pulled some good quotes, which I love because basically Michael told that was he really was pretty frank and said, look, no sport's safe on the program because you can look at what's going on with boxing and weightlifting and it's not certain that they're going to get on the, the program. Baseball and softball are struggling to get back on. Maybe some messages are also being sent to equestrian because of the hullabaloo that's come up with treatment of animals. But one of the better quotes is, to be perfectly honest, I am amazed that you are still on the program. I have watched how over the last three decades, your sport has repeatedly threat has been your sport has been repeatedly threatened with being dropped from the Olympics. You have dodged death multiple times. Some of you either cannot or refuse to understand what is at stake here today. No amount of lobbying or tinkering with the riding format will save you. And one of the best quotes was, let me be very clear. Once you have been dropped from the Olympic program, it's game over. There will be no way back and your sport will struggle to even survive without the Olympics. He's right. I mean, if modern pentathlon is not in the Olympics, the sport is going to end. It, it's the only reason it exists. R right. Because I would imagine that it gets a fair amount of its funding from the IOC. And even though it would be an internationally recognized federation, still, even if it wasn't on the program... I would think that the amount of money you get is greater if you actually show up in the Olympic sport on the Olympic program and are at an Olympics and can share in the revenue from particular games. Do you think Michael Payne is now going to fill the Dick Pound hole in my heart now that that Dick Pound has retired and can no longer go rogue? Well, he can probably, I mean, he'll still go rogue on the side. Michael Payne does not work for the IOC anymore. So He's just able to go rogue. But it, it was interesting because there's still a faction of modern pentathletes who want the writing and want still want to try to figure out how to have the writing in the sport. But the final vote was 83% in favor of obstacle course racing. So if the sport does make it to LA 2028, it will be vastly different from what we saw at Tokyo. It will be vastly different from what we will see at Paris the ride or die are going to have to either learn how to deal with that decision or, you know, like I say, start your own federation and see, see what happens when you try to build a sport that not that many people want to do and is very expensive to get involved with. 
Ah, uh, let's keep it going with more fun news. WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, has filed an appeal with the Court of Arbitration for Sport, also called CAS, against the Russian Anti-Doping Association, known as Rusada, and figure skater Kamila Valieva, following the absence of a decision in Rusada versus Valieva, which, of course, Rusada said we are keeping silent or we're keeping it quiet because uh, did they even give a good reason? No. Okay, they just said, we're not going to tell you what the decision was. And, you know, you can't do it when a medal is at stake because somebody's got to know and we got to make a a real decision about this medal because it hasn't been awarded yet. So we first talked about this last week, but now this is the official announcement. It It was the rumor when we were first talking about it. Correct. So WADA is asking CASC to implement a four year period of ineligibility starting on the date which the CAS award enters into force, as well of as a disqualification of all of her competitive results starting with December 25th, 2021 onward, which would include forfeiting medals, points, and prizes, which would then mean that the Russian figure skating team from Beijing 2022 would not be able to get the gold medal because or any medal. Right, because Valieva would would was on that team and contributed to that victory. Cass's decision would be final and binding, but there's still a right to appeal to the Swiss Federal Tribunal. So that appeal would have to happen within 30 days and have very limited procedural grounds. So it's basically you have a very sliver of a chance to appeal this decision, but I'm sure Russia will find a way. That would be my guess. I'm like, well, they can appeal. I'm sure this is going to happen. Go to another court. Oh, boy. I feel so bad. And I said this last week. I feel so bad for the American skaters, the Japanese skaters, the Canadian skaters, all the other skaters who don't have medals who should. Right. They're just sitting there waiting. Are they medalists or are they not medalists? Especially if those skaters did not win individual medals. Right. This is their moment. They missed their moment on that stage. They missed all of the hubbub that comes after it. And a lot of that hubbub helps them earn money for being able to train and compete in future seasons. So and and of course, cannot be referred to as Olympic champion or Olympic medalist. That's the thing that kills me. Mm -hmm. That they don't even get that very simple moment of being introduced as an Olympic medalist. It's wrong. We would like to take a moment to thank our patrons and other supporters who keep our flame alive financially. Speaking Um, of people who are never wrong. (laughs) If you get value from the show and keep the and the keep the flame alive community, please consider giving back. Visit flamealivepod.com slash support for more information. And we are gonna have some new opportunities coming that we'll talk to you about soon. We're very excited. Big news this week. We have our mascots. They're hats. <laughs> I sound excited. <laughs> and you pointed this out. What is this sudden wave of clothing as mascots? <laughs> right, because we talked about it and then listener Nick posted it on Facebook in our group that, hey, note that the FIFA World Cup mascot, which is coming up, it's just around the corner, that is a headscarf hat type mascot so we're now two big events with two head coverings for mascots and somebody else had a scarf oh really oh my goodness as a mascot yeah so clothing is is the new animal conglomeration don't know if i can go for that but i'm giving the frisias a day in court they are based on the a concept really and these are these small red Frisian caps, which have been a strong symbol of liberty throughout history. They were first worn by freed slaves in Rome, for example. Or, well, I won't say first worn. They were worn by freed slaves in Rome, for example. And it's one of the symbols of the French Republic. There's a painting with the Marianne who's wearing the, the cap. And so that today is a common reference and metaphor for free freedom in Paris. So what Paris 2024 wants to do is promote a new revolution of sport 
and inclusion. And w- that is because the Paralympic Frisia Frig- has a visible disability, has a running blade on its leg. So they have a belief that sport can change everything. I'm not sure how much these mascots will change everything either. They're hats. With legs. Hats with legs. That changes everything. <laughs> Okay, so they have distinct personalities. I was reading through the press kit. The Olympic Frisia is a fine tactician. It's a smart one of the bunch. A true mathematician, it never launches into anything without thinking it all through. With its methodical mind and alluring charm, it will no doubt inspire everybody to do more sport every day. And then the Paralympic Frisia is a real party animal spontaneous and a bit hot-headed it's not afraid of anything it wants to have it all always up for new experiences it will rally everyone around it with infectious energy and enthusiasm the paralympic frige will bring out the best supporter in you spread the values of sport and encourage you to create a buzz and celebrate athletes in all the stadiums and other venues the hot-headedness I don't think is a great trait to imbue on a mascot, to be quite honest. No. And even the party animal. I mean, maybe it's a translation thing. Like maybe the the party animal and hot headed should be more that he's he's fun and up for passionate. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So basically they're hats with eyes and the, the eyes have a ribbon. Uh, One of the eyes has a ribbon, which is the French, the French flag colors. And that's supposed to make it recognizable and identifiable with France. They brought out a couple of mascots for the in-person press conference. And I did read later in Inside the Games that those were prototypes, which thank goodness, because they couldn't move the arms. I, I got to say, I think the 2D and the 3D ones are, even the 3D ones, the, but the 2D ones are really cute. And when you see them doing animated cartoons and they're doing the sports, really cute. And I forget their hats. Seeing them walk around, just kind of leaning from side to side, they can't do anything because those hat corners don't move right now but they're eventually supposed to have arms so they can hug people i'm a little being i'm a little frightened of being hugged by a hat (laughs) funny i wasn't afraid to be hugged by a lantern or a giant glass enclosed panda but yet a hat is slightly terrifying but it is i have to say i agree with you the animated ones they give them a lot of personality a lot of and and yet the they still not have learned this lesson about making those costumes movable. And one of the big things that people were complaining about online is that the running blade version is going to be very difficult for either a two-legged person or an actual disabled person to embody. Huh. You have a point because it's learning how to balance on a running blade. And does that give you the same support if you have a, I don't know how the, I don't know how that looks. If you have a shoe on underneath it and the blade is just kind of over your shoe and that doesn't matter. Or is it a full on piece that you have to learn how to balance on? Right. And to make it actually look like the person doesn't have a second leg or does it look like they've stuck a running blade over a leg? I don't know. One little detail about that running blade is that it's got, I believe, Paris 2024 on in Braille underneath on the sole of it. So that's kind of cool. But it's the first visibly disabled mascot. And that's a good feather in Love your that. cap, so to speak. Or a cockade in your cap. Yes. Yeah. St- uh, reactions have been mixed. There's been comparisons to female anatomy. There have been people who are just, yeah, I don't like it. There have been other people who are on board. And some people, I mean, it is high concept. And I will go with them for having this high concept. We want to revolutionize sport and kind of tying it to other symbols within the Paris 2024 family of symbology that we're talking about. A lot of people thought they were birds. Oh, okay. I, I got that, that from a lot of 
different places that that when people first looked at them, they thought they were birds. I can see that. Yeah, and, and really, the animated ones do look like birds with the the cockade thing. Well, after Izzy was introduced, there were significant changes to that 1996 mascot. So let's go with this is possibly going to evolve into a little more friendlier and get names. They don't have names. La Frige Olympique and La Frige Paralympique is no big Dwen Dwen cuddly name. No, no. And that that doesn't make you excited. You can't identify with it. Why what it really makes it a thing rather than a personality that's going to be the embodiment of your games. I mean their logo has a name. Right. We know she's Marianne. How can you not give these characters actual names? Well, hopefully they will continue to evolve it. They got a year and a half. They're sending the hats on the road. I don't know what people will think of them. It'll be interesting to see them in person. That's for sure. I I also think they look like some sort of dumpling. You know, it's a red folded up dumpling to me. I don't know why. Because you like dumplings. So you're projecting a bit. Mm. I'm much more concerned about the fact that somebody thought this looked like female anatomy. Yeah. What woman's body have you been looking at? I don't know. Did that remind you of female anatomy? Yikes. So we shall see. They do plan on selling 2 million mascot items. Uh, Christophe Béchou. France's Minister of for Ecological Transition is not thrilled that they will be mostly manufactured in China. This was according to Inside the Games. And Tony Estangay, the head of Paris 2024, has said some of them will be made in France. So they've got the whole sustainability thing and we're using recycled materials in the mascots. But then Beshu comes around and says, well, look, you're making most of them in China. And China does not have the best environmental record. What are we really talking about here for sustainability? He's not wrong. No. So the first Paris 2024 shop opened this week in Forme des Halles in Paris. And along with Les Fariges, Inside the Games noted that it will sell apparel by Le Coq Sportif. And call back to our discussion of 1960, Vornay will have, it's, it's one of their licensed apparel providers. So if we see a bunch of like 13-year-old boys running around with Varney shirts and Ray-Bans and extra points if they smell like they've bathed in polo cologne, I am going to be right back in high school. <laughs> Swap out that polo for Dracar Noir. Oh, Guy Dracar! LaRoche. <laughs> and I will be right there too. <laughs> oh, Dracar. Now you're giving me flashbacks. <laughs> We have a little bit of news about Milan Cortina 2026. According to the Associated Press, a Baselga, Baselga di Pine, which is the speed skating venue for the games, will get a roof. And it is currently an outdoor speed skating venue, but the ISU, International Skating Union, and the IOC prefer it be inside, as we talked about with 1960 being outside inside, and Albertville being the last outdoors speed skating venue which did not go well they prefer to have an enclosed space here's where it gets kind of fun i think because this is a project that the trentino region is undertaking it's got a 50 million dollar budget that because the region is undertaking the project that will not get attributed to the milan cortina organizing committee's budget you know we see this so many times in the in the recent olympics where they they fudge the numbers. Right. So we got a little shell game going on. But we'll see what happens. And you know if the budget is $50 million, it's going to cost at least 120 Oh, jeez. Don't want to think about that for sure. But uh, hopefully that will work out. I know that it's been bandied about that. Why don't you just use the speed skating venue from Torino? Because you have a regional games already. Just throw Torino into the mix. But I, I don't know. Hopefully... The, there will be some value in having a speed skating venue within the city of Milan. We'll see. And that is going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think of the Winter Games in 1960. 
You can get in touch with us by email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Our social handle is at Flame Alive Pod, and be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Yeah, and give us a call. We love hearing from you, and our voicemail line is a little lonely, so we certainly appreciate a call. Next week is Thanksgiving in the U.S., so we are going to have a lightning round that will be specially themed. And uh, we'll also have a big announcement about something new we are going to offer, so be sure to tune into that. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive.